wake up with a smile And then in a while Come to lunch with the Welcome to The Libby Show. On this episode, the ladies will talk about their favorite childhood shows, and they'll be joined by special guests, Francois Clemens of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and podcast creator Brad Ferenza. So, let's do lunch with the ladies. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood today. Dr. Francois Scarborough Clemens is an Afro-American singer, actor, playwright, author, mentor, and university lecturer. He is best known for the groundbreaking role of Officer Clemens on PBS's Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. On top of all that, he's a Grammy winner for Sport and Life in George Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, has two honorary doctorates, and is an Alexander Twilight artist in residence emeritus at Middlebury College. We'll be talking to him today to find out about everything that he's been doing and something that he's doing currently, which is a podcast. And joining us will be the creator of that podcast, Brad Ferenza. I'd like to introduce Brad Ferenza. He is an award-winning actor and writer whose artistic style blends observational humor and existential contemplation. His original projects include Awakening Arlene, Breaking Points, and The Lady Yang, starring such talent as Vincent Pastor of The Sopranos and Ranjay Dolores Cantania. His plays have been presented in New York and elsewhere. He is the author of over 50 articles, a concept album, and several books, including vignettes, which Around the Sun draws from. His new podcast, Around the Sun, is a scripted series about human connections and stars award-winning actors, including Marsha Mason, Sally Struthers, B.D. Wong, Alicia Reina, Francois Clemens, and more. It is so exciting to have both of you here. Um, and isn't what, Zoom wonderful because we can converse with people that are living in different places. Ladies, first I'd like to ask you the question. When you were young, what shows did you watch? And what shows did your children watch? But not you, Messa, because your child <laughs> is still very, very young. When I was very young, I loved Romper Room. I loved Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Um, it was the original safe space. And we could talk more about that. And I watched Looney Tunes because that was all that was on for kids. My daughter watched something called Teletubbies, which was awful, I have to tell you. <laughs> um, they both watched Barney. And surprisingly, they didn't like Sesame Street, which I think is extremely clever no matter what age so I mean, that's what we were watching I, my mom wanted to let me watch pbs and uh, so i definitely watched mr rogers neighborhood and i loved it um, and i also loved a cyber chase which was a show all about math and uh, so I, I loved that because I was always ahead in math class because of it and um, basically anything that was on pbs i watched i just loved it i watched mr rogers neighborhood i watched the Magic Garden, and I watched Romper Room. And all of the, well, first of all, we didn't have a whole lot of stuff to watch. Um, it was luckily, very, yeah, right? Um, they were a little black and white TV with antennas and sometimes PBS <laughs> didn't come in all too clear. Um, but I do wanna indulge you and I'm not a singer, but I think aside from those shows being very kind, I remember the music from them. So I just wanna sing a few, a few tunes from those songs. Uh, from those shows. So Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, I think everyone knows that song. It's it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day in the neighborhood. And that's all I'll sing for that one. <laughs> then there was this show called The Magic Garden. And it was two girls and they had this thing called the Chuckle Patch. And the song for that was another happy song. It was, um, this is the garden of make-believe, the magical garden of make-believe. Okay, that was that song, show. Then Romper Room, Beth, you said you watched Romper Room. They had that exercise song. It would be exercise, exercise, come on everybody, do your exercise, and then you would freeze. I mean, it doesn't sound that interesting these days, but when we were kids, that was a big thing. We'd be exercising and then we'd all freeze. Oh um, yeah, exercising was not something that was mainstream back then. 
that's right, that's right. It was fun to watch. And I looked forward to that part of the show. Or am I getting that confused with One Dorama? That's one it. Drama. That was One Dorama. Which I also watched, like you did. Yes, yes. Rock Room was the one with the magic circle, right? She held the magic, the magic mirror. Magic mirror, that's it. <laughs> and then there was one other show, and I'll sing the beginning to that, and that was Come On and Zoom, Come On and Zoom, Zoom. Beth, do you remember that one? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a show called Zoom. Also On PBS as well, out of Boston, right. Yes. I want to start by talking about the podcast, because that's how we got to meet Dr. Clemens. So, Brad, can you tell us what Around the Sun is? Around the Sun, as you said, is an episodic scripted audio drama, aka a scripted podcast, so it differs from some people's understanding of <laughs> what a podcast is, where it's typically interview after interview, which is great, but just so the viewers know, Around the Sun is scripted. And Dr. Clemens, as well as me, as well as the other wonderful people Messalina referenced, they all play roles. They're not there speaking as themselves, they're inhabiting a character, which is really cool. So it kind of maps back to the old days of radio plays, which I wasn't around for, but I did grow up with heavy influence from my grandparents. So I remember a couple of holidays getting them the shadow on cassette tape and um, everything old is new again. So that's around the sun. Dr. Clemens's episode is the single piece that is a, effectively a solo performance. And in this solo performance, spoken from the perspective of a New York City marathon runner, the runner, Dr. Clemens's part, is chronicling each stage of his life borough by borough. And again, when I say his life, I mean the runner's life, not Dr. Clemens's life. But Dr. Clemens's episode, like all 10 episodes, hopefully there is something to communicate or relate to in the human experience in what the runner, Dr. Clemens's character, is experiencing or reflecting upon. So borough by borough, we hear about his life and hopefully here and there, a little hint of our own lives. That I think is where the social relevance comes in or the, the broader appeal. Every episode, like, like all good art, should say something broader, should make a broader statement about humankind. And I think Dr. Clemens's episode, which is the last episode, it has a special place in my heart. And I think it has a special place chronologically in where the episodes uh, come from and where they lead to. Yeah. Dr. Clemens, can you tell why you chose to be in this podcast? When the episode was presented to me, what I found most interesting is that it made me think. Think. I mean, really think deep about my own life. I'm looking at you guys. You're talking about the shows you watched as youngsters. I was around before they invented television. <laughs> I'm a senior member of this outfit, and I'm aware that uh, the programs you watched, some of them I watched, but uh, many of them I did not because of the phase of my life and I was moving on when you guys were just beginning. So that uh, episode that Brad had uh, allowed me to share reflected my own life, different mm -hmm. phases. I lived in Manhattan for 35 years. So I feel a deep relationship to the marathon and to, to the different boroughs that the character was going through that were equal to life. So you have your younger life, your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, until you are older, you're coming around the, uh, in Manhattan, Fifth Avenue or something, and then 59th Street and into the park. And <laughs> there were times that I felt like I was, I'm personally going into the park. Uh, at 76, I've had my share of illnesses and challenges in life. And I don't pretend to think like I did when I was 20 in one of the outer boroughs. But there was something that uh, about Brad's writing, and about his portrayal that made me think about it a lot. And that was the attraction. I like things and stuff 
make me think, help me to think. I, you were talking about Vermont earlier and why I like it so much. I do sit and I do a lot of thinking. And I'm a, I'm a full-fledged writer now. I have a cave over there that I, I go into and I close the door and I do a lot of thinking and writing. A lot of the writing is stuff that you can tear up and throw away. But some of it I think is important for me as a, um, as a maturing older man who has experienced certain things in this life that have given me a different perspective and given me on some extent some wisdom are things that I'm mistakes I'm never going to make again. <laughs> That's what I mean by wisdom. We all have that. And my perspective now is of a 76 year old person who lived a good life, and, uh, overcame many obstacles, which the runner is thinking about and even thinking about quitting, stopping, uh, is, is going to go on. The, uh, so that's the long answer, but the thing about it was I'm fascinated with movies or cinema or film. And Brad gave me an opportunity to explore that part. Uh, despite the fact that I did Mr. Rogers for 27 years, now I feel more like I'm reflecting myself, not Officer Clemens. Brad's uh, writing and his direction, his sharing with me helped me to imbue what I was doing more with me, who I am. And that found very enriching. I still think about it. Thank you very much, Brad, for including me and uh, making it such a memorable experience. Thank you, Dr. Clemens. And if I can say a bit more, I'll say, so the right brain side of me is all about the writing and creating that character before knowing that Dr. Clemens would say yes. And then the left brain, the administrative side of me is before knowing Dr. Clemens, before knowing he would say yes and we would connect so well in a spiritual way, in a cerebral way, in an artistic way. Mm -hmm. It's thinking who in the pop culture zeitgeist do generations of people have a reference point for? Who maybe was part of their developmental process? And suddenly you go from the pop culture zeitgeist at large to a very small pool of people. And I'm very, very lucky that Dr. Clemens said yes, because it's almost as if the role was meant for him artistically and almost as if I wrote it knowing he would say yes. You have a gift. It, it <laughs> really, you. it really works, really works well. I encourage everyone to listen to the podcast. It's on the Broadway Podcast Network. It's available wherever, wherever podcasts are found. It's called Around the Sun. And um, Marathon is the name of the episode that Dr. Clemens mm -hmm. is on. Um, and Dr. Clemens, um, I want this, this full rich life that you've led, which is an extraordinary life. I'd like to tackle some of the things that you've done in your life in the next uh, part of the show. Um, I think we can't, um, you know, one of the things that we have to start with is your time on Mr. Rogers, the iconic scene of you sharing a pool, taking a break from your day, sharing a pool and a towel with Mr. Rogers. Um, you know, please, for people that are not familiar with that, tell us how that, we know the, we, un, you know, the gravity, the significance of that cannot be understated. Can you tell me um, how that scene came to, came to be? Well, uh, first of all, Fred is a very insightful, was, I say is, isn't that interesting? Uh, a very insightful, very, uh, he listens like that deeply. He doesn't just listen on the surface. And when I came to him, frankly, enraged, that someone would pour chemicals and powder uh, like that was difficult for the skin into water where children were going to be playing. There seemed to be such an outrageous, negative, horrible thing to do. So I was watching it on television and going through my whatever. So I went to Fred and I said, we have got to do something. I view him as a very influential man. And I thought, 
society would listen to him. Mm. And he kind of calmed me down and said, he understood my rage. He understood my, what, what I felt. And he said, let's think about it. Let me think about it. Well, from then on, he came to me with a script. And frankly, when I read the script, I thought, yes, what is this? Where are the guns? And where, when are we going to, uh, you know, get our army together and go to the, the municipal pools in Nashville, Memphis, Birmingham, wherever, Cincinnati, and start shooting up some uh, sins, sinful guys? And he said, no, no, friends, just trust me. Let me, let me show you. And I folded everything in and decided, all right, but what is he talking about? Well, my discovery was that Fred was really talking on two or three levels. He wasn't just talking on the physical level, which I was. He was also, uh, and he presented the idea of doing this scene. And we did a rehearsal. And in the rehearsal, being with him, talking with him, was transformative. Mm -hmm. So much so that I began to say, oh, what else is going on here? Well, Fred was talking about integration of, with the races, and how ridiculous it was to hurt children who are playing in a municipal pool. But he was also talking about a spiritual link between us. A spiritual link goes back to the New Testament when Jesus was in the uh, after the resurrection is in the upper room and he said to his disciples let me wash your feet mm -hmm. and they said no because you're the leader and you're the this and that and he said if you cannot if I cannot wash your feet you are not my disciple he was speaking on a spiritual level with me in terms of my opinion discipleship and he had a legacy Mr. Rogers neighborhood and he was building his legacy on this rock, which is what Peter signified. And I, when I began to understand what I thought liturgically he was saying, I was very uncomfortable. I mean, very, because I thought I'm playing a role, but it's the real me. It's about integration and segregation and racism in America, but I'm not a biblical person of the, the heaviness of St. Peter, as we call him. And so I thought, Fred, no, you're way off. <laughs> and so we started doing the scene. And he has a presence. And his presence was steadfast and very, very supportive. So as I was going through it, he pulled me into his orbit. And I settled down and I began to think differently. And in the biblical story, it talks about the great teacher took the stone that had been discarded by the builders. And that's the one he built the great temple with. And I heard Fred in his way of saying, you are black, poor, not learned it like me, or gay, are so many elements that would be considered outcast. I am the brick that the builder discarded. And Fred was taking that brick and he was saying, on this brick, I will build my church and the very gates of hell shall not prevail against them. Well, I thought, Fred, you got the, have you got the right person for this? All of a sudden, I felt tremendously overwhelmed by the weight of responsibility. The, he was my mentor. He, he, I thought, was handing me a, a heavy bundle to carry. I had carried a great deal in my life, being gay, being black, mixing in certain circles where I was rejected and I was not welcome. And here we are again now. I'm, a, I'm trying to scoot away from the responsibility. It's heavy. But at the same time, something inside of me said, your better you is knocking. Wakey, wakey, Francois. The real Francois must wake up. I'm sorry if that's a, a, a long explanation. Fred was phenomena. And whatever you think of me is 25, 100 times more. He was so 
special. We have lived during the era of a holy man. That's all there is to it. And we know it. He has walked among us and we have listened to him. We have heard him speak and we are blessed. I am blessed. And I know it. So I feel I have a, an obligation to carry that burden well. And that's what I do in my life. And yes, and, you know, watching that, I think Beth and I and, and Brad, um, um, we were all touched by that show. We didn't realize how we were touched by that show, how much it formed us. Um, and the risks that you both, you, you both took, you know, the world is not created. It's not made a better place by people that just stay in their comfort zone. So I just yes. have to like you know, thank you for taking that risk because it became such a big part of your life. Those of us who grew up with Mr. Rogers and all of the wonderful people in his neighborhood, there was something very special about that. Do you think that show would be as popular today? Oh, no, I could answer that immediately. Uh, I thought about 90 or 93, 94, it was coming to a proper close. People were interested in energy and um, what's it called, uh, Electric Company and uh, mm -hmm. Sesame Street. Those programs were very fast by comparison. Fred was slow. So I thought we would be passed up and that society would move on to things like MPV and other stuff. It would not be. But what I have uh, traveled, I did a performance in person recently where there is such a need for love. We, uh, this pandemic not only visited this virus upon us that killed many of us, we stopped touching. And that's a part of the human experience. Uh, I'm looking at each one of you the whole time. You don't have masks on. Masks, I feel, are for health and for survival. When I leave, I have three or four of them in my pockets and I just take one out and put it on. But I've uh, developed a relationship with the people who have sponsored me and that sort of thing. That, Unfortunately, most of the time, they have to stay away. There's no hugging and kissing, which I'm very good at. So I stay where I am and ask them just to let me see who they are. And they take the mask like that, and then they put them back on. But we, Fred, was a, he embraced that human experience where you not only see each other, you feel each other, uh, you smell each other, you hold each other. And then we have lost that. And the, the, the universe, our nation is crying out for more intimacy, more touching. What we do now, we don't have to have masks on. But we have missed, I've never embraced Brad. And I would love to say thank you. And to you and to the, all of you, there's, we're working on this, you know, but we're not there yet. I'm, uh, I'm enormously grateful that we had that because we know what the best is, what's that thought? We know it. Now we have to find a way to get back. Dr. Clemens, I would love to hug you right back. <laughs> and yeah, when I think back to Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, it is all about accessing your feelings, mm -hmm. being okay with exploring your feelings. Yes. And in response to Beth's question, which isn't mine to field, but I think Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood does live on concretely in a show like Daniel Tiger, which is a direct mm -hmm. extension, but mm -hmm. just helping young people be comfortable with their feelings is, that's the zeitgeist too. Yeah, and I, I think that there are some shows, and again, my children are in their 20s now, when I have grandchildren, I'll be watching them a, a, bit, a bit better, but even shows like Barney have, parts of it that reflect what Mr. Rogers started. You know, there was a song, say a song about how to say please and thank you. That's mm -hmm. what you, that's, that's what you need. That's what I grew up with. Um, so I think that there's a legacy of Mr. Rogers neighborhood that's reflected in so many other shows, though they are probably to Dr. Clement's point at a much faster pace um, than what we watched as a child, which was a perfect pace for me. I was fine with the, the little puppets right? and i think well, for a lot of other people also i um uh grew up with 
Captain Kangaroo. Oh, yeah. And, and as I said, the invention of television. So yeah. when I was in my 20s was when Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood uh, began. My uh, uh, transformation came about directly from knowing him. Singing for him, I sang American Negro Spirituals at Third Presbyterian Church, and then he invited me on the program. And the more I was around him, the more uh, I became fascinated. But I also uh, fascinated in the sense of watching what he did, did and does. But I was fascinated uh, at my own reaction, how a black man like myself would have such a committed relationship with a white man who had so many uh, gifts in our culture. And frankly, many gifts that I did not have. And so I was suspicious. And I say this because I mean it. Fred talked the talk and he walked the walk. It was an uplifting experience and it's not over. As we were talking about extraterrestrial things and what have you, there is something about this man that I think will go on for the next five, six hundred, maybe a thousand years. But he touched many, many people. It was such a simple message of unconditional love, mm -hmm. unconditional care, unconditional trust. Mm -hmm. I carry it on to unforgiveness, unconditional forgiveness. It's, yeah, uh, I, I hope that the show, I don't know, I would imagine on one of these streamers, I would hope that the oh, show- Oh yeah, would, it's, would it's shown on, like on, on Hulu. Oh, that's and, good. Uh, 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 a couple of those other- Shows that I don't watch that show films over and over, whatever, to sign up for them. And also on, on uh, YouTube, they have different oh, that's segments. That's true. Everything, everything's Everything. on YouTube. <laughs> yes. And Vimeo is another one. I've seen stuff. It's my children send me links that I uh, check and, and buy, through those links, they show me things that I've done, things I've completely forgotten about. Uh, it has been so long. It's 27 years that I was on the program. And he's been dead 20 years but like that. And so, you know, it's like for a long time, Lucy and Carol Burnett and those shows have remained with us all low all these years. And I think um, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, the people who watched the program were three, four, five, six, seven, like that. They are now 40, 45, 50. Some of them pretend they have children that are grown and adults. And I don't know if I believe you, Suzanne. But there are some children you know, who grow up and they write to me. I have a whole load of fan mail over there that I have to answer from people who have children. They want photographs for their children. I did a performance uh, in a part of Vermont and half the kids in there wanted to take a picture and have me tell their parents, hello, and sing, how are you today? This is Officer Clemens. Something, you know, I did 25, 30 of those to their parents. Experiences like Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, things that were close to us in childhood, it's like soul food. And I think well, in times of pandemic, we want to connect to that. We want hugs. We want Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. We want what's familiar. You mentioned about your singing and... I have a sneaky suspicion that that might be one of your true passions. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about your singing and how you started the Harlem Spiritual Ensemble. Some things happened in New York and my uh, professional singing career came to an abrupt halt. And I did lots of oratorio, you know, the Handel, the Messiah, uh, the Bach's oratorio, the, the Mozart Requiem, things like that. And uh, I loved American Negro Spirituals. I couldn't get enough. I would sing them at home to myself, by myself. Uh, and so I, circumstances led me to call a number of my colleagues. Much to my joy, every single one I called said, yes, I would love to come over to your house and sing some spiritual. Well, I was living in New York. I had this apartment and I had a piano. I said, well, come on over. It was very informal. And I cooked, you know, some cornbread and some greens and some okra. I'm a good cook, by the way. If you come up to Vermont, <laughs> I will feed you soul food. I love that you said soul food. So uh, I had people come over to my house and we were just singing informally, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. But it was so intense and so committed. They knew what the essence of the songs were and what I was trying to 
communicate. So I said, you guys want to do this all the time or more often. Everybody said yes. So I started writing, communicating with churches and musical organizations around Manhattan, Brooklyn, like that. And almost 100% said, yes, come on up here and sing. Well, the problem with that was there wasn't any money in it. So uh, I took money out of my 401, 401k, what's it called? Um, That's it. Retirement. And I used that in order to pay my singers. Because what I realized after about five or six uh, engagements where the organization might give us $350 or 500, there really wasn't very much to go around for these professional artists. So I added to that money that they would have gotten and we made like 75 or $100 each. Well, they, they kind of laid on me that you're the leader. You, you brought all this together. So I wound up getting incorporated and paying for rehearsals. They got faithful. And we started going around and got a reputation. And I found it to be tremendously satisfying. Something deep inside of me was touched. And I shared that. And I shared it with my, my singers and uh, my percussionist and pianist. And the next thing you know, we, uh, I wrote to some people. And I got an agent for us, a musical, uh, someone to book us. And we started performing at university uh, campuses. And those campuses were so responsive because nobody was singing on a professional level like I was doing American Negro spirituals. We have, for example, uh, junior high school basketball, high school basketball, college basketball, and then we have the pros. Well, we have kids who sing that way. We have college organizations that do spirituals very well. And they're not all black, but we did not have a professional organization on the level that I imagine, mm -hmm. would go out there and present a program of the highest artistic level. Well, with all due respect, that's what we did. And everyone kept saying, why didn't we do this all along? Why has no one else thought about doing it? Well, you know, here I am. And sure enough, we went off to Europe. Uh, the agency sent us off to Europe and we were a huge success. Uh, and I did it for 20 years. What I have to say about it is traveling is romanticized. It is very, very, <laughs> it's hard to stay on the road. All the, I once spent nine months on the road. And imagine if you had to take your baby, Messalina, out on the road for nine months. Come on. There's so many things that need to happen in a personal relationship. If your partner's not singing with you, there's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I frequently ask my singers to bring their spouses, their lovers, their uh, husbands or wives, whatever, bring them along. And we found a way to pay for it. A lot of times the airlines and the travel agency gave us a block of uh, tickets. Uh, if there were 10, 11, 12 of us, they gave us three extra uh, tickets. Uh, the, the husbands and wives obviously shared uh, a room and what have you. So it turns out not not to have been more expensive than just the price of the, the plane ticket, which it frequently covered uh, because we were like uh, uh, United or American or Delta. We were doing so much business touring all the time. They knew and they said, oh, yes. And we joined those clubs where you build up, uh, 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 you have, uh, you, you know, you have extra uh, points. So we could go off on the next time to Europe, next time somewhere else to, to Asia, to uh, Tokyo or to Korea. So it was not the, the hardest thing to bring a spouse along. And that was one thing that saved us. But it was very, very hard physically. That's so nice that you're able to um, like be so um, thoughtful for everybody and including them. Cause like family is so important. So I, just, I love that you, that you did that. That's like, that really speaks to me. Um, I would love to know what is your favorite song? Like what what uh, out of I mean I'm sure that's a really hard question, but what was it? <laughs> it is a hard. It's, I thought about it so many times uh, since I've received my package. First of all, <laughs> I probably don't have a favorite song. Now, now that I said that, somewhere oh. over the rainbow way of high, there's a 
man that I heard of once in a lullaby. I love that song and I sing it fairly often. Fred Rogers wrote, there are many ways to say I love you. Mm. There are many ways to say I care about you. Many ways, many ways, many ways to say I love you. There's the singing way to say I love you. There's the singing something special someone would like to hear. The singing way, the singing way, the singing way to say I love you. Cleaning up your room can say, I love you. <laughs> Making special pictures for the holidays and making plays. You'll find many ways to say, I love you. You'll find many ways to say, I care about you. Many ways, many ways, many ways to say I love you. Oh, that was, that was, that was just beautiful. Absolutely. Gratitude in my eye. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm just saying something about the lyrics and, and your voice. I just took a deep breath and, and I felt a sense of calm. And something about music, Suzanne, that I think connects us in addition to Dr. Clemens's beautiful voice. That was really so special. Earlier on, I want to go back to something you had said. You talked about uh, the influence um, that maybe your mother or, or aunts or, or some woman had on your life. And since we're a show with women, um, can you talk a little bit more about what, what they did with the women in your life, how they affected you and how they propelled you to be who you are today? I have to tell you, I've thought about that. And the word that came to my mind was beloved grit. They took care, the women took care, they nurtured and they encouraged. They also taught me how to survive. They were the ones who said, don't look at the white man in his face. Don't raise your voice. Don't answer any questions that you're not asked. You don't, just be quiet. Keep your eyes down. But there were also the ones who said, oh boy, that is just beautiful. Once they discovered that I had a voice, my great-grandmother sang, my grandmother sang, and it's so interesting, Miss Alina, because I used to say I was singing in my mother's womb, and I came out singing spirituals with these ladies who were there. I never did not sing, but it was my great-grandfather who took me fishing, who we used to make up songs that words and stuff had, you know, they were all made up this magic cane, and I sang things that I thought he wanted me to sing. We, we, had, we played a game back and forth, back and forth. Then when I listened to my great grandmother sing, I have a voice in my soul. I've been in the storm so long. I've been in the storm so long till and I've been in the storm. So long, Lord, give me a little time to pray. Now, when I get to heaven, gonna take my seat. Give me a little time to pray, and I'll take my seat. 
and my Savior has been. Lord, give me a little time to cry. I've been in the storm so long. I've been in the storm so long, children. I've been in the storm so long. Give me a little time to pray. Thank you. What a what a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> For people listening on YouTube, they're going to find an awful lot of treasure in this episode. Yeah. And Suzanne and Messalina and Beth, a little birdie tells me you may or may not hear of some Dr. Clemens singing in his episode of Around the Sun. Okay, okay. Duly, duly noted. So <laughs> Dr. Clemens, um, you have a lot of accomplishments in your in your life. You just uh, last year you wrote the book, Officer Clemens. But of everything you've done, what are you most proud of? I think uh, you ask hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to ask the same questions everybody asks, and I want to know about you. <laughs> well, uh, what am I most proud of? Well, probably starting the Harlem Spiritual Ensemble, because I realized a number of times, if I was in Vienna, Berlin, Paris, Rome, down in uh, Sicily, and over in uh, Asia, when I walked out there on stage, we were doing something uniquely American. We were selling American Negro spirituals. And I had uh, had a lot of people dismiss the incredible value and depth of spirituals saying, well, they were just ditties that black people sang in the fields when they were working in the South, you know, on the plantation, what is this? But I discovered years ago that the nature of this, this creation out of slavery, out of rejection, out of hurt, out of pain, had something to say today, something to say to humanity. And so, I went back and started doing my research. And I said, I'm going to try and find what my great grandmother was singing about, what my grandmother mm. was singing about, what my mother, what they were the ones. And I, I heard them and I got, I wanted, I couldn't get close enough to that, uh, that grit, understanding the suffering, the rejection, the pain. And nevertheless, they sang. I, it was profound to me. I, that's what, one of the things I sat hours thinking about. What must have been on this woman's mind? The, uh, the rejection of being stomped down. There were black women who were uh, not too much older, 25, 30 years, who had had affairs with white men against their will, who had babies that were mixed. So you had black children like me and you had children with blonde hair, maybe even blue eyes, all in the same family. What was that burden like that they were carrying? I, I, that's, what, that's part of what I sing about. And it's also what I realized how deep my love is for them, for this country, and that we have had an experience, but it has given us a pearl. We have a jewel, and it's the American Negro spiritual. Dr. Clemens, you are truly a Renaissance man, though, because it's not just music. I also read that you do a lot with poetry. Can you tell us about some of the poems you've oh, written? Oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> You're getting them all. Um, the thing about my poetry was I used to use it to hide. I, if I had a crush on a guy, um, not just men, but peers, some of my peers, I had crushes on them, but I couldn't date them. We didn't have a dating situation. So I wrote poems about them. I also wrote poems about the great people that I love, like uh, um, Nina Simone. I wrote a poem to her. I wrote a poem to Maya Angelou. I wrote a poem to Leontine Price. There were all these great singers that I wanted to be 
relevant, that's the word. I wanted to make a contribution. And I saw Leontine Price and Marian Anderson, those great ladies in particular. Also, I wrote love poems and I read stories about Langston Hughes, James Baldwin, uh, you know, uh, Dante Cullen, all the Re Harlem Renaissance writers who wrote poems uh, about River Nile or about my black skin. And so I wrote my poetry trying to capture the feeling of being uh, um, an outsider, A, who also had black, sweet, very sweet love. So I, I did, didn't have anyone I could discuss it with, so I wrote about it, what it felt like to be on the outside, wanting to be accepted, wanting to be loved, wanting to reveal. That was the other part, just revealing that I was gay. There were so many um, circumstances that, you know, once Fred said you can't come out, because uh, Heinz and Heinz and Johnson uh, and Bibby stuff and Sears and all of them, they would not support a program that had an openly gay person. So I was asked to stay in the closet. That maybe is one of the worst things I ever did. But I know why I did it. It was important for me to stay there, to be there for the children. Now I mean it when I say children, I mean all children. But I was especially there for the black children. I was especially there for the gay children. I was especially there for trans. I don't judge. They are all mine. I am a natural born mentor. I learned mothering from my family. And that's what I stand on, my truth. And so I, I picked up my burden and put it on my shoulders and put my head down, kept going. Forming a relationship with a young person or any person who's different from you, the collective you, you're seeing the world through their eyes. Yes. A little bit. You'll never know the totality of their lived experience, but on some level, there's empathy where there otherwise wouldn't be if you didn't know that person. That's right. Yes. But also, it's, it's going to take time. That's the other thing. It's not going to happen overnight. And mentoring gives you 10 years, 15 years. I mean, I was with Fred 20 years, and he still had that patina of being a father, daddy. And I, I needed daddy ing. So at first I tested him. But after a while, I thought, you know, <laughs> he means it. He's, he's the real thing. So I stopped testing him. I became an active part of the family and allowed myself to love. I love, Dr. Clemens, that you said that Fred Rogers walked the walk. And I love the notion that there are different ways to walk the walk. Society needs people to carry a flag yes. and pursue policy change and be the boots in the street. But society also needs people who can get their message across in subtle, humble, honest, genuine ways like two people bathing their feet in the same pool. Yeah, so writing a play including black people, not leaving us out. You know, when I see a, a, a show on television or I see a, a, a Broadway show or I see a, a, an opera or something, I look to see if there's anybody that looks like me. We were talking about your favorite movies and stuff. The first time I saw movies in 1955, I think it was, Dorothy Dandridge and Harry Belafonte did um, Carmen Jones, I think it was. My goodness. My eyes were like saucers in that movie theater. And black people could be up there on the screen. They looked beautiful. They were beautiful. And they were not being slaves, servants, shoeshine boys, or something. It was something magnificent that made me want to be up there on that screen. And then I saw, um, I saw Dorothy uh, Carmen Jones. Oh, poor game Bess. Oh, my God, the music. It was different than Carmen, but hearing them sing those melodies, and I felt I, I can sing like that. I used to go off you know, by myself, and I would practice, and I said, I'm going to sing that one day. <laughs> oh, Lord, have mercy. But, you know, we have to teach our children to have big dreams. I, I'm constantly telling myself that also. Come on, stay, keep your dreams going. And I watch them, and I feel them coming true, and I know there's 
something deep and wonderful and dreaming. So watching those movies where there were black characters helped me, allowed me to dream. Paul Robeson, Marin Aniston, Leontine Price, Sammy Davis Jr., Lena Horne, Earl Bailey. You know, all of a sudden I had an identification. It's really great when people can be represented as people. So if someone is a person who happens to have a disability, it's great when they're represented in a role that's not written for a person with a disability. You know yeah. what I mean? The oh, conflict or the story yeah. arc is not written about the disability. Right. They're just a person in life, which is how we know many people who happen to have disabilities. Right. People first. People first. Yes. Okay. And, and, and I... I am happy to see that in this century, it, we're starting to see so much more representation and it's, you know, it's just something you were talking about dreams. I think it's the dream mm -hmm. of people to be able to see themselves. I mean, I'm a female, there's all this stuff about, I mean, so many people are not represented the way they should be on the screen. And I think we're starting now, it's a start. It's not perfect, but I think it's a start. No, you're absolutely right. And don't get me started about the age of feminism. Because <laughs> don't really get me started. <laughs> don't get all of us started. <laughs> there is something in the air, there's something in the water that women are taking their place. Uh, look at this presentation today, how blessed it is. And uh, there are other women who are stepping forward and saying, I'm here. This is who I am. I admire that tremendously. Oh, well, thank you. And I, I think it's also, it's not just women, but I just think, and I always say this on the show, everybody has it in them to do something great. They just have mm -hmm. to go and do it um, and take those risks. And, and you've done those risks. You've, you've taken right. those risks and you're verbal about it. And I can't tell you how much we appreciate just listening to you. Um, it's, it's just, it's eye-opening listening to you and hearing the struggle that you've had and what you've done with your life. And I just want to turn it over to something a little bit lighter than that, but also something getting into deep, something I know that you're really into is, uh, I know you use meditation to relax. Can you talk yes. a little bit about that? Well, I have to tell you, I started meditating when I uh, was living in uh, Manhattan. I found the frenzy of my life, busy traveling, rehearsing, coaching French, coaching German, coaching Italian, and learning new scores and all that. Uh, it began to get to my nerves. You know, I was uh, hyper. And a friend of mine, wonderful friend, she teaches at Manhattan School of Music and Dance. Hilda said, do you meditate? And I said, well, no. You know, part of it is that I don't want to sit on the floor. I'm not a guy who gets down and up easy, you know, and I've had two knee replacement surgeries and et cetera. So I like to sit in a comfortable chair. And I discovered that there were people said, oh, you can sit on your couch wherever you're comfortable. Sit down. So I did, I started meditating and lo and behold, uh, I got a sense of well-being. And meditation can take many, for many forms. It can take, mm -hmm. it can be walking. It doesn't have to be just sitting in one space. We've mm -hmm. talked about that quite often on the show about how different ways to meditate and how it's- most people in the marathons find that uh, element that takes them over. Yes. It gets high. I used to run about 50 years ago and uh, <laughs> I used to get high. I felt good. I could run 10 miles. It was very exciting and fulfilling. And now this is how I run. <laughs> Got it. So, I, 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 <laughs> um, so at, the end of, at the end of our show, we always like to um, talk about a charity that's near and dear to our guest's heart. And Dr. Clemens, can you please tell us what yours is? Oh, I certainly can. There's a wonderful organization here called Women Safe, and I have been a uh, silent contributor and supporter of theirs. Silent only that if I'm away somewhere and they say we have a charity that you would like us to make a contribution to, I have them send money to uh, Women Safe. Uh, during my life, unfortunately, there was a lot of violence in my home, a lot, nightmare level, and. I, well, I vowed that first of all, I would never be violent to anybody else. I know what it feels like. It's a nightmare. And so I decided when I came here to Middlebury, Vermont, there was this organization that I wanted to support of young women who either get pregnant and need, a, need help and comfort, but also women who were the victim of home 
some kind of domestic violence. But mm -hmm. I want to support them and let them know that there are people who will listen to them, will help them to get out of that home, et cetera, et cetera. So Women Safe is doing that work for the young women as well as the older who sometimes are with an abusive husband for years and now they want to get out of there. But I would like to support Women Safe. Thank you. We'll put, we'll put that, we'll put this site up for everyone to see. Um, Brad, do you have Thank anything? You. I'm going to go ahead and give my endorsement to Dr. Clemens's organization. I'd like to thank our guest, Brad Forenza. His podcast is Around the Sun, Broadway Podcast Network, wherever podcasts can be found. And Dr. Clemens, from the bottom of my heart, I don't walk in your shoes. You have helped me understand what your shoes were and it's the best I can do. And you shared your journey with us. And I think we all feel the same way. Thank you for, for sharing it. Um, it just, um, it makes our lives better and it enriches our lives to hear the life of a fellow human being. And I also wanted to thank you for all that you've done um, because um, it, it's touched us all. I'm honored and deeply honored. You're part of our story, Dr. Clemens, locally and globally, you're the American, part of us. The American story. So as I always like to say at the end of each show, every day, find some joy and give some joy. Thanks for watching. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wake up with a smile.